Hello and welcome to this Revision Monkey video on what's going to be in the Combined Biology Paper 1 exam and this is for foundation tier for the AQA specification. Well in Biology Paper 1 about 10% of it will be calculations, about 15% will be required practicals and then you'll also have lots of tables, lots of explain questions, compare questions lots of graphs and evaluate questions as well. So let's look at how to answer an evaluate question. Now not only can this come up in biology paper one, it can come up in any of your six exam papers for science. So evaluate, let's have a look at a typical question. It says evaluate the use of embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells to treat paralysis. So what that word evaluate actually means, but they don't tell you, is give advantages and disadvantages of both embryonic and adult stem cells to treat paralysis, and then give your own conclusion as to which one is best and why. They don't write it like that because it's too wordy, so instead they use the word evaluate but you must know to get marks in these questions, you must give advantages and disadvantages of whatever's in the question and then come to your own conclusion about which one is better. And there's no right or wrong for that, okay? You just take one particular stance point and suggest which is better and give a reason why. For example, if we're looking at this question, you could have sentences structured like this. An advantage of an embryonic stem cell is, another advantage is of an embryonic stem cells is, and you're putting it on a plate for the examiner. You're really showing them that you're listing those advantages. And then disadvantages as well, making sure you're putting it on the plate and listing your disadvantages. And then you have to do the same for the other one. So for example, adult stem cell, Again, make it really clear that you're saying whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage. And then finally, you write your conclusion. So good to start with the word overall, and then also have the word although in there, because that gives it a justified conclusion. So for example, for this dance point, you could put overall, I think adult stem cells are better, because although they have a limited ab ability to differentiate, I think they should be chosen because they are less likely to be rejected by the patient. So you must justify why you're choosing your one you're choosing at the end. Don't just say overall I think you should choose adult stem cells. You need to justify your answer. So if you see that word evaluate, don't forget advantages, disadvantages and a justified conclusion. That's what it means. Compare questions, again, they just write compare, but they don't tell you what to do. So you need to remember, if you see a compare question, for example, compare a bacterial cell to an animal cell, what it really wants you to do is give similarities and differences between bacterial cells and animal cells. It won't tell you that, but you need to remember to say things that are similar and also the differences, but they just give you that one word, compare. So just bear that in mind. For example, you could structure it like this, where you would say similarities, and you would list your similarities, and then you state your differences as well. And you need to get both of these things in the question. Now for the differences, I've highlighted the ending ER, okay, so these make the words comparative, so animal cells are larger than bacterial cells. Don't just write animal cells are large, because that's not comparing it to the bacterial cells. So as many of these ER words, larger, taller, heavier, etc., that you can get in, the better. If you can't um, use an ER word, use the word whereas. So for example, animal cells have a nucleus, whereas bacterial cells do not. So remember, compare needs similarities and differences in your answer. And let's look at the explain questions. 
explain the results in the table. So the results in the table are showing the distance of the pond weed from the light and the number of bubbles per minute. So a little snapshot of data from one of your required practicals. So explain doesn't mean that you write as the distance between the pond weed and the light increased, the number of bubbles per minute decreased. That's writing a conclusion or describing the results in the table. Explain means why have those results happened and basically just try and chuck in as much science as possible. So some type of things that you could write down would be things like the light intensity is a limiting factor affecting photosynthesis. The closer the light is to the pond weed, the higher the light intensity the plant is receiving. The rate of photosynthesis increases as light intensity increases up to a point when light intensity is no longer a limiting factor. So you can bullet point all of these key scientific details which explain why those results are what they are rather than describing the results. And you might increase your explanation further by writing about the chlorophyll is absorbing the light and one of the products of photosynthesis is oxygen and oxygen bubbles are released by the pondweed when it's photosynthesizing. Hence, the closer the pondweed, the higher the number of bubbles released per minute. So explain questions are often quite a few marks, so bullet point lots of scientific um, facts which explain and say why the results are what they are. I just want to highlight now some calculations um, some that you might want to brain dump in the exam and by brain dump I mean as soon as the examiner lets you begin if you think you, these are going to fall out of your brain you can write them in any white space that you can find on your question booklet. So the equations that you might need to recall for this paper are the magnification equation magnification equals image over real so you could literally write down M equals I divided by R. Okay, as soon as you get in the exam, just in case you need it. Now for foundation, they do sometimes give you the equation. But in case they don't, it's there and you've written it down ready in case you need to use it. Another one is magnification equals the eyepiece times lens. So this one helps you work out what magnification on a microscope you're using. Percentage change is a really important one for paper one and to calculate percentage change you do the change divided by the original and then multiplied by a hundred and then finally this could come up on any of your six papers is uncertainty. To calculate uncertainty you do the range divided by two. So just four important equations I recommend you learning for this exam. Here are the required practicals for biology paper one, so there's quite a few, there's photosynthesis, enzymes, microscopes, osmosis and food tests and some of these will come up and 15% of the marks will be on required practicals. So microscopes first of all um, are something that we can use to look at very small objects like cells. So we might prepare our, si our slide here with our cells on. And unless we stain them, they're really difficult to see. So you might want to put a few drops of iodine on them or something like that just to stain the cells. Then a cover slip on top and it gets put onto the stage. We look at the um, cells using the eyepiece, which is the top bit. This often has a number on it, for example, times by 10. And then we have the lenses below again, which will have numbers on them, perhaps 4, 10 and 40, for example and some focusing knobs or focusing wheels you'll often have a coarse one and a fine one which i'll just draw on here as well so the main points then is that we need to start at the lowest magnification we calculate that by doing the objective lens multiplied by the eyepiece so for example if this lens is four the eyepiece is 10 we know we're looking at the cells at 40 times magnified and this one would be 10 times 10 so 140 times 10 so 400 so we start on the lowest one 
and to focus the cells we need to use the focusing knobs now in the exam if they give you a picture of cells that are a bit blurred then it's these focusing knob, um, knobs here that you need to use to view the cells in more detail you need to increase the magnification so if the question asks about how you'd look at more details inside the cell you need to talk about changing the objective lens and if you want an even more detail you might want to use a higher resolution microscope for example your electron microscope this one is just a light microscope Moving on to the next um, section of this microscope then is this equation which you're going to need to remember for your exam. Magnification equals image size over real size. Now they could ask you to work out the magnification or they could ask you to work out the real size. The image size is what you actually measure. So let's take this question. What I suggest you do as soon as you get into the exam, brain dump this um, when you're asked to begin your exam, brain dump it on a bit of white space if you can't remember it. Magnification equals image over real. The pollen grain in the image is magnified 800 times, so that's our magnification. Calculate the real di diameter and give your answer in micrometers. Now, if you could do the first couple of steps, that's really good. That will get you two out of three marks. And if you can do the conversion at the end, that is a bonus. So if we are to measure the image size, we need to get our ruler and we need to measure the diameter of the cell. In this case, it's four centimeters. I strongly recommend you measuring in millimeters as it will be more accurate and it helps you um, with the conversion later on. So 40 millimeters is our image size. And we've got 800 as our magnification. So we need to rearrange our equation so we get real size equals image divided by magnification and then we put our numbers in. So real size equals 40 divided by 800. But because we then have to convert it to micrometers, this would give our answer in millimeters. We need to then convert it into micrometers by timesing by a thousand and that gives us our answer of 50 micrometers if you do the first couple of steps and work out this is 0.05 then that will get you a couple of marks but just don't forget these prefixes um, nano micro milli etc to convert to if you need to osmosis then we'll talk a little bit about the content and then the required practical so osmosis this is the definition that confuses people movement of water from a dilute to a concentrated solution this means from where there's lots of water so a high concentration of water to where there's not so much water a low concentration of water so you can use either definition in the exam but they may may well talk about it moving from a dilute to a concentrated solution so in this practical, we put something in a sugar solution. So outside here, we've got our sugar solution. Now I say something on purpose. Don't be thrown out if what they put in is not a potato. It could well be, but it could be a carrot or a beetroot, or it could be a sweet or anything that contains sugar inside. Because the potato itself or the, the vegetable or whatever we're looking at has a particular, particular sugar solution inside. So when we put it in the beaker here, in this situation, because osmosis is the movement of water from a dilute to a concentrated solution, the water would move inwards, increasing the mass of the potato. So it's just an arrow up to show increasing the mass. However, in this situation, the solution inside the vegetable is more dilute than the outside. So the water will move out of the vegetable into solution. And in this case, it will decrease in mass. Now, at some point, you're going to get a situation where there'll be no mass change when the solution inside has the same concentration as the solution outside. And we'll look at that in just a minute. Now, the osmotic balance of cells is really important. It's really important that you don't have too much water or too little water. If you have too much water in your bloodstream, your cells are going to take in that water and swell and if you have too little water and you're dehydrated your cells are going to shrivel up and will not function very well 
That's why when you have, um, after exercise, you'll often drink a an isotonic drink. That has the same concentration as sugar as your blood. So when you're drinking that, it will quickly replenish the sugars that have been used up in respiration and um, things like that during your exercise, and it won't affect the osmotic balance of the cells. So uh, drinking isotonic drinks afterwards are really good after exercise. So what results would we get from this practical then? Well, we put our vegetables in different sugar solutions, like so. We'd want to try and cut them so that they were similar lengths and widths. Okay, that's going to be a control variable. And we want to keep them at the same temperature. We're going to measure the mass change and we're going to change the concentration of sugar solution. So our results may look a little something like this. We've got our different sugar solutions, our mass before. Note that they're slightly different because you can't cut a piece of vegetable or a sweet or whatever it is to be exactly the same mass. So we have the mass of the potato afterwards and we can calculate the mass change. Now what you're going to need to do is one of your math skills, especially in biology, is calculate percentage change. So the difference in the mass of the potato would be 3, so the change would be 3, 15 minus 12 gives us 3, and then we would divide that by the original, which in this case it started off as 12, so 3 divided by 12 and multiplied by 100 will give us a percentage change for this first one of plus 25%, plus because it's increased in mass. If you do the same for the next one, change divided by original times 100, you get plus 18%. And then the final one, you will get uh, a minus 25% because this one has actually decreased in mass. You might then need to plot these on a graph. So if you're looking at the sugar concentration against percentage change in mass, when it was zero, that was plus 25. When it was 0.5, that was 18. And when it was 1, that was minus 25, somewhere down here. And then you'd be looking at drawing a line of best fit. Now, if this graph, graph was any good, which it's not, they'll often be in a, a straighter line than I've done there. But we'll draw a line of best fit through using a ruler. And this is the key point. Where it crosses the line, this sugar concentration here, if we were to read it off our axes, they'll give you better axes in the exam. This would be the concentration of sugar solution inside the potato. Because at this point, there's no mass change. So this is the concentration of sugar solution inside the potato. Boiling vegetables, if you were to boil vegetables, this disrupts the cell membranes, so they are no longer partially permeable. So if you put a boiled piece of vegetable inside a solution, you won't get a mass change because those partially permeable membranes are not functioning anymore. Now, typical questions for osmosis. So it could be in relation to the movement of water inside and outside of guard cells, for example. Guard cells are the cells that open when they are turgid and full of water and they close when they are flaccid. You could talk about the movement of ions and water in relation to guard cells. They may talk about osmosis in relation to root hair cells, which we'll talk about later on or just general movement of water in body cells. Moving on then, food tests. So the food test for fats um, is not one that you're going to be asked to recall anymore. So you need to concentrate on starch, sugar, and protein. So first of all, you'd crush up some food, mix it with some water, add it to a test tube so you've got your food solution in here. And then there's three tests that you're going to have to remember. The first one is the test for starch. This is iodine. You add iodine, and if starch is present, it will turn from orange to black. The next one is sugar. That's Benedict's solution, which will change from blue to orange. Now, you may see other words. If there's a little bit of sugar, it may change green. If there's loads, it may change a, a red color. 
the blue to orange is your main um, color change. This one requires a water bath at around 75 degrees. Okay, so for the sugar one, you're going to need to heat it up in a water bath. And finally, protein is by a ret test, which turns from blue to purple. Moving on to enzymes, we're going to do the enzymes required practical. So I'm just going to take this moment to do a bit of the theory behind enzymes. They are made out of proteins. Topic two, uh, sorry, biology paper two, you talk about DNA coding for amino acids that make proteins. And proteins fold up into a very particular shape. This here, hopefully you'll be able to recognize as the active site. And the thing that goes into the active site, we call the substrate. So one theory is the lock and key theory, which says that the substrate is an identical match to the active site. And a slightly more complicated theory is called the induced fit theory. And that just says when the substrate goes in, the active site just changes shape ever so slightly to grip the substrate in but nevertheless you're going to have a a specific shape that is going to match the active site if the enzymes are at too high a temperature they denature you cannot say they die because they are not a living thing they're a protein and what that means is the active site changes shape and that will no longer bind the substrate. Okay, so when they denature, the active site actually will change shape. And if the substrate can't bind, then it can't go in and be split, for example, from a large molecule into smaller molecules. Let's look at the practical then. This practical focuses on amylase. Amylase is an enzyme that breaks down starch into sugar so we start off by putting a certain ph in because this time we're going to look at how ph affects enzyme activity so the independent variable we're using is ph we could use a range of buffers like ph3 ph5 ph8 etc we're going to measure the rate of enzyme activity and we're going to control temperature and the volume of enzyme starch that you're using, etc. So we're going to put the pH um, buffer in there, and then we're going to add the amylase on top, and we're going to heat it to 37 degrees C. We're going to try and control that because that is the optimum temperature for enzymes. We're going to set up over here a spotting tile by adding iodine into every single well, and that will go an orangey um, brown color. And then we're ready to add our starch. So the final thing that we add into our test tube is our starch. And then straight away, we will take a sample out of our test tube and we will place that in the spotting tile. So we'll take a sample out and we will then be able to put that in our spotting tile. And our iodine is going to be testing for the starch. So if starch is present, that iodine is going to turn black. Can't change the color at the moment, so I can't turn it black, but these ones here will change black. And again, I would take more of my sample out, do it in the next well, and again, that would turn black. All the time that the starch is still present within here, our samples are going to go black. But eventually, the amylase will have broken down all of the starch into sugar. So at one point, you're going to put your sample on here and it is going to remain orange. And at that point there, you know that um, the amylase has broken down all of the starch. So you do it every 30 seconds, 30, 60, 90, 120, etc. And let's say we got to this point and all of these were black and all of that stayed orange, we would know that the reaction had finished and the enzyme had finished breaking down the starch. Now to calculate a rate from that, if you're doing foundation, I wouldn't worry too much about this, but higher tier, to calculate a rate from this experiment, we need to know the equation 1,000 divided by time. Final one that I'm gonna briefly go through is uh, photosynthesis. Now these are fully in detail on another video. 
um, if you want a bit more detail. So the independent variable is the distance between the lamp and pond weed. That, in turn, changes the light intensity. The dependent variable is the number of bubbles per minute. In this case, you need to be talking about either this or in terms of a rate of photosynthesis. You could have, if you wanted to, and you may see in the exam, a gas syringe attached to it. And rather than measuring the number of bubbles per minute, you may well measure the volume of gas produced. The control variables then, temperature, power of the lamp. So you might want to stick with, for example, a 40 watt lamp, the length of pond weed and the time of pond weed. And you start at a certain distance, count the number of bubbles per minute or the volume of gas produced per minute. And then you would do that at a closer distance as you move the lamp and so on and so forth. Next, I'm going to look at some math skills. First one has a lot of relevance to biology paper one, and this is surface area to volume ratio. Let's work it out for this one. So if we're looking at the surface area to volume ratio, we need to calculate the surface area. So let's remind ourselves that we calculate the area of one side and then multiply it by six because there are six sides. So this one would be one times one and then multiplied by six. And that would give us a surface area of six and the volume length times width times depth. So one times one times one will give us a volume of one centimeters cubed. And obviously that was centimeters squared. So that would give us a ratio of surface area of six to one volume. And you may need to do this in biology or later on in chemistry or physics. So it's a skill that we need to know. For this one, surface area would be three times three for the area of one side multiplied by six, which will give us 54 centimeters cubed, squared, sorry, squared. Uh, and the volume three times three times three, which is 27 centimeters cubed. If we put those as a ratio, we'd have 54 to 27. But it's quite difficult to look at and compare at this point. So because this one's at a one, if we try and also get this side to a one by dividing it by 27, that will give us one. And we need to do the same to the other side, divide by 27, and that gives us a ratio of two. So you might need to do that calculation and also understand that smaller organisms, if we suggested that this was an animal, for example, a smaller animal has a larger surface area to volume ratio than a larger animal. So something like a bacteria, oxygen can diffuse really easily into the bacteria because it's got a large surface area to volume ratio. However, for us, it's a lot more difficult. That's why we have things inside our body to increase surface area, like our alveoli and um, like the fish, they have their fish gills and things, which we'll talk about in detail in, in a minute, and villi in the small intestine. We have things to try and increase our surface area. So a bit more maths, and then I'll come back to those exchange surfaces. Averages, you might be asked to actually write down like this, how to calculate an average, so make sure you know how to do that. If we look at the first trial, we carefully check for anomalies, and they all look quite similar to each other. So we would add all of those up and show you're working out in case you make a mistake add all of those up and then divide by five and that gives us our answer of 11. for set b you need to look carefully and you'll notice there's an anomaly here so just circle that one and leave that out of your calculation nine plus nine plus ten plus eleven divided by four and that will give you your answer of 9.75 however next learning point you must round this to the same number of decimal places collected in the table so they might talk about that as being a mistake if someone's done it wrong so round that up to 10. uncertainty if, you, if you're writing that list of calculations to remember this is definitely one uncertainty is range divided by two we don't know where, where it's going to come up um, it could come up in um, Biology, it could come up in chemistry or physics. So uncertainty is the range. So if we looked at uncertainty of result A, the range is 13 to 10. So 13 minus 10 will give us 3. And then we divide by 2. So our uncertainty of those results is 
what we always put in front, plus or minus 1.5. They may ask you to calculate uncertainties and draw them on a bar chart, for example. There's your bar chart. And you might have calculated your uncertainty as plus or minus 1.5. And the reason why it's plus or minus is you would show it plus 1.5, minus 1.5, for example. And the bigger the error bars, the more uncertainty you have. Median then. Next, write the numbers in ascending order. The median is the middle number. So if we took these results here, we would write them in ascending order. 19. 22, 22, 25, 26, 27, and 28. So make sure you can write it out like this and also then choose the median number correctly. And the mode is the one that appears most often. So in this case, 22 appears twice. So that is our mode. Graphs, nice and quickly on graphs then. Not too much to say here, only that... Um, you need to show you're working on, gra on graphs. So if you're asked to work out something from a graph with a ruler, go as accurately as you can to the graph and across, showing that working on the graph and then writing your answer. If you have a relationship like this, for example, don't forget that you can draw a curved line of best fit. Now this one is sitting outside of the curve, so I'd treat that as an anomaly, and I carefully draw my cu curve as close to as many of the points as possible. Don't join them up. Similarly, you could have something that looks like that. No straight line necessary, because you can see that it's got a curved relationship. So carefully put a curve on there. A directly proportional one is a straight line through the origin, so it could be like that, or like that or like that, they're all directly proportional if it's a straight line. And inversely proportional means that as um, x gets bigger, y gets smaller. So it will look something like that. So as one gets bigger, the other one gets smaller. Tables then, so we've got um, sketch graphs. You might be able to draw a sketch graph of a data. Some people are lazy and lose easy marks. Take the whole title from the table don't make something up or convert it or change it in any way take that whole thing and write it underneath the sketch graph take this whole label write it on your sketch graph and then you would have a look at the relationship so it goes up and then look here it flattens out so carefully look at the data if you're asked to describe this you need to talk about it increasing and then leveling off and staying the same. So your sketch graph would look something like that. Labels on and the sketch curve. Right, let's go through a little bit of uh, content now then. First of all, I'm not gonna go through these in detail. Hopefully you know cells by now. You need to name all the parts and all the functions. I'm gonna highlight a couple of points though. Simple cells without a nucleus and mitochondria, without those subcellular um, structured parts are prokaryotic or prokaryotes and ones with subcellular structures that are structured like mitochondria and chloroplasts and things like that are eukaryotic cells. Okay, the difference between plant and animals is that plants have the cell wall, the chloroplasts and the vacuole. They have all of the other things that the animal cell does if you're asked to compare them. And the bacterial cell often has a loose bit of DNA and also sometimes has a ring of DNA as well called a plasmid. Not all of them, but some of them have a flagellum for moving. The cell cycle then. In this topic, we're talking about mitosis, okay, for growth and repair. From the moment that you are a bundle of cells as an embryo, until, well, you're still doing mitosis now, okay? You're doing mitosis now for growth, okay? You're still not fully grown, and you're doing it for repair. So any cell division that starts off with one cell and ends up with two identical cells, we're talking about mitosis, not meiosis. Meiosis is paper two. So get that out of your minds and think just about mitosis. So you might see this kind of pie chart along with it. This shows the time that it takes for 
um, each stage of this cell cycle process because actually the mitosis part of it is that is a small amount of time so we've got growth and DNA replication because if we start off with one cell like we saw before that's got things like cytoplasm inside ribosomes mitochondria and all of that needs to double up so that we can make two cells at the end of this process so that takes a long time also the nucleus contains 46 chromosomes and we need to double that up as well and when they do that they make an identical copy of themselves so the chromosomes will look a little bit like x's like that so they've copied themselves up ready to be split into two cells now the my mitosis bit okay that's all the growth and replication the mitosis bit is the splitting of the chromosomes to make two different nuclei so the cells the chromosomes sorry will line up in the middle and then they will be pulled apart and you'll start to form two new cells it might have a bit of a let me draw it over here it might have a bit of a weird uh shape like that as it starts to form the two cells so it's now got two different nuclei in each have identical uh, 46 chromosomes and then this is the mitosis part okay so this part here where the chromosomes are splitting apart and where the two new nuclei are formed that's mitosis and the final bit they might split up this bit into saying the final bit here is when the cytoplasm divides and two new cell membranes form. So when they actually go from that bit to two new cells, that's the final bit of the cell cycle. Stem cells then, there's a couple of places. Think about where in the body um, and the other place that you can find stem cells. So stem cells are found in bone marrow. Those are quite good. They can differentiate into things like blood cells. However, the stem cells that are really good are embryonic stem cells because you started from an embryo, so they make every single cell type. They, they can turn them on to make a muscle cell, a liver cell, cells to replace your cornea in your eye, whatever it is. They can turn into any type of cell. Now, the trouble is with stem cells is they don't contain your DNA if they're taken from a random embryo, and perhaps that will be rejected by your body. So this is the next stage up, really, that um, scientists and doctors are looking at at the moment, and that's therapeutic cloning. That's when you take an egg cell donated by a woman with her DNA in it, and you take her DNA out, so you have an empty eggshell. You take one of your body cells with your DNA in it, and you remove that and combine it with the empty egg cell. So you've got an egg cell that's capable of dividing and it's got your DNA in it. So then you'll stimulate that to divide. Sometimes that's by an electric shock. You'll stimulate that to divide and it will start dividing by mitosis to produce embryonic stem cells. Now, if you were to leave that in the right conditions um, and implant it into a woman, that would make a clone of you. OK, but they don't get to that stage. They only get to the stage where they're making cells and then you can use that to make muscle cells, liver cells, etc. OK, let's move on to transporting particles. And I'll try and link these into other themes of the topic. This is an important theme that runs through biology paper one. The first one that we'll look at is diffusion because we've already looked at osmosis in a bit more detail. Diffusion. Over here, definition, movement of particles from a high to low concentration. So in both of these cases, concentration is higher on the outside compared with the inside. So oxygen would diffuse into the cells. However, this is the bit that's important. The rate of diffusion depends on the concentration gradient. That is the difference in the concentration between inside and outside of the cells. A big difference like this one, you're going to get a high rate of diffusion. A small difference like this one, the rate of diffusion is going to be slower. Still going to move in the cell, but it's slower. So a key point, 
the bigger the concentration gradient, the faster the rate of diffusion. Comes up several themes throughout the paper. And one thing we'll talk about is exchange surfaces. So I mentioned them briefly before. Because we've got a small surface area to volume ratio, we're going to need things like the alveoli in our lungs with a large surface area. So we take in oxygen and that needs to move into our blood. If our blood wasn't flowing, we wouldn't be very good at exchanging oxygen into the blood because we need to maintain a difference in concentration. We need to maintain a concentration gradient. So the blood takes away the oxygen as it flows. If you didn't have that, then you wouldn't be able to diffuse the oxygen over. Similar way to fish gills. So fish gills, fish need to take in oxygen and they have gills with filaments, again, to increase the surface area. So these are the filaments. And they have even more surface area on top by these little fins called lamellae on top whole purpose is to increase the surface area. Now, through those gill filaments, you have water going in one direction and blood going in the opposite direction because the water is going to allow the, is carrying the oxygen that will diffuse into the blood and you need the blood to take it away in the opposite direction to maintain that concentration gradient okay the bigger the difference in concentration the faster the rate of diffusion you've also got the villi in the small intestine which are the folds to increase the surface area so osmosis and active transport but this time within the context of a root hair cell water will move in by osmosis from a dilute solution to a concentrated solution or you can say from a high concentration of water to a low concentration of water and ions think about how they're going to move look these ions in red are in a low concentration on the outside and a high concentration on the inside so those will move in by active transport this is a kind of a, a linking thing that they might ask in a longer answer question active transport goes against the concentration gradient, sorry, against the concentration gradient. Okay, because you're going from where there's fewer particles for, per volume to where there's more particles for, per volume. So this is the normal concentration gradient here, conch gradient, but active transport goes against that, okay? So talk about it going against the concentration gradient. And for this, it needs energy. And in the cell, the part of the cell that provides the energy is the mitochondria through respiration. So talking about six markers here, how things move into the cells and the fact that you've got mitochondria that provide the energy for active transport. Then the water and ions that are have moved in, we will then see those travel up through the xylem. So water and the ions move in an upwards direction only through the xylem, and we call this the constant transpiration stream. The xylem itself is dead. It's strengthened by lignin because if you just had dead cells, it would be very brittle and it's hollow to allow the water and the ions to move up and the loss of water from a plant is called transpiration so if you have a leaf we'll talk about the leaf later you've got holes on the bottom and unfortunately water can be lost and the factors that increase it if you increase the temperature that will increase the water loss or the rate of transpiration if you increase the light intensity, because it will be doing more photosynthesis, all the stomata will be open. And think carefully in terms of concentration gradients. If you decrease the humidity, that means there'll be less water in the air. Okay, humidity is all about the water in the air. If you're low humidity, you're going to have more, a bigger difference between the concentration of water in the leaf 
to outside. So you're going to have lots of water leaving. And if you increase the airflow, a little bit like the blood in the fish taking away the oxygen, increased airflow would take away the particles from underneath the leaf, again, maintaining the concentration gradient. The leaf, so I'm trying to link this with photosynthesis. Again, trying to link your ideas with six markers and things like that. So can we name all the tissues? We've got uh, to link it to this equation. So carbon dioxide and water make glucose and oxygen. So the epidermal tissue is the top layer that covers the leaf. The waxy cuticle is right on top of this. And now this is to reduce the water loss. Okay, it's not to anything about keeping it waterproof or anything like that. It's to stop the water coming out of the leaf into the atmosphere. The palisade cells are part of the mesophyll layer. Okay, this whole layer in the middle is the mesophyll. It's separated by the palisade mesophyll, mesophyll at the top. Specialized cells full of chloroplasts for photosynthesis. Spongy mesophyll at the bottom, gaps in between to allow carbon dioxide to diffuse up to the palisade cells, and again covering epidermal tissue at the bottom. You've got guard cells, which are here and here. These control the opening and closing of the stomata. You might just see the word stoma or stomata, stoma being one, stomata being many. And the final vessels xylem and phloem. So if you're linking this to photosynthesis, you need to be talking about carbon dioxide diffusing through the stomata, which are controlled by the guard cells, the spongy mesophyll having gaps to allow the carbon dioxide through to the palisade layer, and this having specialized cells full of chloroplasts of photosynthesis. The epidermal tissue is thin to allow sunlight through, and the xylem is what's going to bring the water for photosynthesis. Now, in that process, you are going to um, know, need to know about limiting factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. So light intensity. If you increase light intensity, you will increase the rate of photosynthesis. But the, the point that it levels out here, at this point, light intensity is no longer a limiting factor. Okay, if it was down here, it is a limiting factor because if you increase the light intensity, you'd get more photosynthesis out of the plant. Carbon dioxide, luckily, has the same pattern, so it's nice and easy to remember. And the temperature one, because it's related to enzymes, has a little bit of a different look because if you increase the temperature, the rate of photosynthesis increases um, up until its optimal point, and then the enzymes will start to denature, decreasing the rate. The glucose that we make in photosynthesis then, again, trying to link together some ideas about the leaf and the phloem and photosynthesis. The glucose that we make, or not, not that we make, but plants make, needs to be transported. And that is transported in the phloem. And it's used for several things. Could be a five marker. For respiration. So the opposite of this is respiration. It could oxidize it straight away with oxygen to, to release energy. It's stored as lipids, so fats and oils in things like seeds, stored as starch. For example, a potato is a big starch store. It's used to make cellulose for cell walls and to make amino acids, which make proteins. Now, this one uses nitrates from the soil as well. So the bottom one, the plant needs the glucose and nitrates, with it, which it gets from the soil. Then it will travel in the phloem. These are the living cells, similar to xylem. Um, in fact, they're tubes that transport things. But they've got pores between the cells. They're not completely hollow. And sugar can be transported in both directions. So tra phloem transports the food, and the food is obviously sugar or glucose. And we call this process of moving sugars around translocation. Linking on to respiration then, there's aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration that we need to be aware of. So definitely being able to recall these things is key. Again, if it's something you struggle on, then this might be the thing that you brain dump when you start the exam. So glucose reacting with oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. 
We show that by the symbol equation, C6H12O6 is our glucose, reacting with oxygen, making carbon dioxide and water. And it's not written in the equation, but this is obviously, the purpose of this is to release energy. That's what respiration is, the release of energy from glucose in your cells. And as a reminder, happens in the mitochondria. So it happens in animals and plant cells. Anaerobic respiration in animals, so that includes your muscles, turns glucose straight into lactic acid. If there's not enough oxygen, you get a lactic acid buildup and that causes cramps. And in plants and, ye and yeast, the anaerobic respiration equation is different. Glucose is converted to ethanol and carbon dioxide. This one, this product here that's made, is used in alcoholic drinks. And this product is used in the baking industry to help the bread rise. Now, when you're making bread, you actually make ethanol as well. But as soon as you put it in the oven, that boils and is taken away. Okay, let's move on to the heart and lungs then. So with the heart, you need to name the major vessels going in and out of the heart. So you've got the aorta, which is the main artery. This part of the heart is the left-hand side, and this is the right. So it's the opposite to what you think. This has a very thick muscular wall on the left-hand side compared to the right, because the aorta takes the blood around the whole body. So it needs a thick muscle to push and force the blood out a longer distance. When the blood goes around your body, oxygen will diffuse into your cells and your blood plasma will receive the carbon dioxide and that will come back in through your vena cava, which is your main vein. Now, if you remember those two, the other ones are easy because on each side of the heart, you have one artery and one vein. Okay, so if that helps you remember which way the pulmonary one goes, that might help. But if you've got the blood coming back from your body, it needs to go away to the lungs. So you need to um, send it through the pulmonary artery. It goes to the lungs, which we'll talk about in a minute. It gets its oxygen through diffusion through the alveoli, and it comes back in through the pulmonary vein. You've got cells in your heart that control your heartbeat. They are in the right atrium, the top chambers of the atrium, and these are the pacemaker cells. And you've got valves in between the atrium and the ventricle, which is the bottom section, atrium, ventricle, valves that control the blood flow. And those are the things that can go wrong and you might need replaced. Up to the lungs then, you've got the trachea, you've got the bronchus, and then splitting off for a larger surface area, the alveoli. The three blood vessels, the artery, the vein, and the capillary. The artery is the one with the thick muscular walls, so it'd have a relatively large lumen, but quite thick muscular and elastic walls because blood flows at high pressure. The vein has a very large lumen, which is the opening, and it has a valve inside to stop the backflow. And the capillary are really thin, just one cell thick, because out of there, all the oxygen needs to diffuse to the cells around it and sugar and things like that. Okay, exercise. I'm going to highlight to you the keywords that are going to come up in exercise questions. Again, if you're looking for longer answer questions especially, they're going to be looking for an increased heart rate, an increased breathing rate, and maybe breathing volume as well you can put, because you want increased blood flow to the muscles, because you need more oxygen for respiration, to release more energy. So in these kind of exercise questions, as long as you're getting the words energy, respiration, oxygen, blood flow, you're going to be hitting the marks and just making sure you're saying whether they're increasing or decreasing. Okay, we're trying to do a bit on digestion and enzymes. So when you digest food, it goes through your mouth, first of all, and it goes through your esophagus into your stomach. Your stomach has an acid in it called hydrochloric acid. That is one of your defences against disease. When you eat food, if you take bacteria in, that acid will kill the bacteria. You've then got the food going through the small intestine where nutrients are absorbed and then the large intestine where water is absorbed. Now the conditions in the stomach 
are acidic. However, the conditions in the small intestine are alkali. So enzymes that work in the small intestine love alkali conditions. Enzymes that work in the stomach love acidic conditions. So what we need to do is stop the food from taking all of that acid into the small intestine and ruining the conditions for enzymes. So the final thing is we've got bile, which is produced in the liver and stored in the gallbladder, which is next to the liver. And it neutralizes stomach acid, and that's one thing that it does. And it also emulsifies fats, which means it takes the big pieces of fat and turns them into smaller particles like so, creasing the surface area so the enzymes can get to it. Let's add some enzymes on then to our um, diagram. I thought about this today, so I'm always thinking about a way to link things up to learn them for you. If you remember it as apple, A-P-L, apple, you will remember it in the order that they appear in the human body. A is amylase, that first starts working in the mouth, and amylase breaks down starch into sugar. P is protease, and that first starts working in the stomach, and protease turns proteins into amino acids. And finally, lipase starts working in the small intestine, and in fact, all of them work here, so all three enzymes work in the small intestine. That's where most of the nutrients are digested and stored. And lipase turns lipids or fats into fatty acids and glycerol. Okay, so all three enzymes work in the small intestine. That has the villi, again, trying to link your ideas. It's an exchange surface, so it's close to a blood supply which will quickly take the nutrients away and maintain a concentration gradient and all the small pieces will go into the blood. The pancreas is hidden behind here. This is where all three enzymes are produced as well. So three enzymes produced in the pancreas, but the food doesn't go into there. It actually goes into the small intestine, which also produces the enzymes. Moving on, defense against disease. The blood contains several things. It contains red blood cells, and they have no nucleus because they just need to bind oxygen. Okay, that's all they need to do. And their red pigment is called hemoglobin. Platelets, cell fragments, um, help the blood clot. Okay, so the cell fragments in there help the blood to clot. Plasma is the liquid, so throughout the blood you will have liquid, so that will not only carry the cells and the platelets, but if they talk about substances, you're going to want to talk about things that are dissolved in the blood plasma, like hormones. You know in the menstrual cycle, hormones travel in the blood. In the blood. Carbon dioxide is dissolved in the plasma as well. White blood cells then. Okay, we've got a red ones, we've got a white ones. The white blood cells fight disease. So think to yourself if you know the four things that they can do. So one thing, produce antibodies. And they will match on the antigen of the pathogen. So if this is the pathogen trying to fight your body, it's got antigens on the outside. And your body produces antibodies to match those in a specific shape. Your body also produces, your white blood cells produce antitoxins because pathogens produce toxins that make you feel ill. So these antitoxins neutralize the toxins. And finally, the reason why I said four things is because they can engulf pathogens. And as a fourth mark, you may need to recall the word phagocytosis, which is when the, um, the white blood cells will come to a pathogen and engulf it and then digest it. So do not say eat, they don't have mouths, okay, remember they're um, just the white blood cells, so talk about engulfing. If you want to prevent yourself against disease, we said the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, the skin also produces antimicrobial substances, um, and you might want to take a vaccine. A vaccine is a dead or weakened form of the pathogen, okay, so you might want to take those to prevent disease as well. 
Okay, a couple more things, not too much left now. So we've got cardiovascular disease. If you um, eat lots of cholesterol, the bad cholesterol is LDL cholesterol. Okay, that's bad. That's not good. LDL cholesterol is bad. And what it will cause is fatty deposits building up in your arteries. Now, the heart itself, as well as all the arteries that come out of it and the veins that go into it, the heart itself has its own supply of arteries that it's wrapped that wrap around it. Those are called the coronary arteries. And if these get blocked, it reduces the blood flow to the heart. And therefore, if we try and link our ideas, it will reduce the oxygen going to the heart. And that will affect the respiration and the energy that the heart can release through respiration. So it's going to affect um, its ability to pump the blood around. So with coronary arteries, you could, um, if you've got a blockage, you could treat it with a stent. And this is a metal device that requires an operation. You pop it in and it will open out your artery to make it wider and increase the blood flow. Or you can take statins, which are drugs, which reduce, re reduce the cholesterol. On the topic of non-communicable diseases, these are diseases that are not caused by pathogens and diseases that cannot spread. So tumours and cancers come into this group as well. So there's benign tumours, they are cells that will uncontrollably divide, but will stay in the same place. And you've got malignant tumours, they will uncontrollably divide, but cells can break off and travel in the blood, and therefore you could end up with tumours elsewhere in the body. And this one is the one that is cancerous. Risk factors then for non-communicable disease, it will depend on the disease, but things like smoking, alcohol, obesity, and having a high fat or a high salt diet. And now for the B3 content on infection and response, starting with communicable disease, which is a disease, a disease that can be spread. Pathogens are microorganisms that can cause disease and we're going to look at four main ones which are bacteria, viruses, protists and fungi. And pathogens can be spread by water or air or direct contact. Let's now compare the main two which are bacteria and viruses. So bacteria are prokaryotes they, some of them have a flagella, which is the tail for movement. They are single cells and are smaller than animal and plant cells. They replicate rapidly around every 20 minutes. And they release toxins that make us feel ill. So that's how bacteria make us feel poorly, by releasing toxins. On the other hand, you've got a virus. This is smaller than a bacteria. It's not living and they're not cells. Instead, they are just a, simply a piece of genetic material wrapped in a protein coat. Viruses replicate inside cells. They then burst out of the cells and this destroys our body cells, making us feel ill. So here we've got a picture of a body cell. The virus attaches to it, inserts its genetic material, which makes multiple copies of the virus and they then burst out of the cell, physically damaging the cell, and that's what makes us feel ill. And then we've got protists. They are eukaryotes, unlike bacteria, which we said were prokaryotes. They are single-celled. Some are parasites, and they're often carried by a host, which we call a vector, that doesn't catch the disease itself. And then we've got the fungus. Some are single-celled. Some are made up of thread-like structures called hyphae. And these hyphae can grow and penetrate surfaces of animals and plants. And the hyphae can also produce spores, meaning the fungus can spread to other organisms. Now we're going to look at a couple of bacterial diseases. So there's lots of facts to remember. The first one we're going to look at is 
salmonella, which is a bacteria that causes food poisoning. So perhaps you'd want to pause the video and have a think if you can remember the symptoms and prevention of salmonella. So for the symptoms, it's fever, stomach cramps, diarrhea and vomiting. And prevention, you can vaccinate poultry and good food hygiene during food preparation. So washing your hands and disinfecting the surface that you are working on. The next bacterial disease is gonorrhea, which is a sexually transmitted disease. So again, you might want to pause and think if you can remember the facts about symptoms and preventions for gon gonorrhea. Symptoms are pain when urinating and a thick yellow or green discharge from the penis or the vagina. And prevention, using a barrier method contraception, for example, a condom or a femidom. Then looking at viral diseases, the first one is measles, which is a disease spread through droplets in coughs or sneezes. So again, pause, have a think if you can remember the symptoms and prevention of measles. So symptoms include a red skin rash, fever, prevention is vaccination. So the MMR vaccination vaccinates for measles, mumps and rubella. HIV is a viral disease spread by exchanging bodily fluids through sexual contact or sharing infected needles. A sufferer would experience flu-like symptoms and it lays dormant and then can suppress the immune system, making it difficult to fight off other infections. So because people have a weak immune system, then things such as colds and other infections are very dangerous. To prevent HIV, you should use barrier method contraception, for example, condoms, and don't share needles. HIV is treated with antiretroviral drugs, and the late stage HIV is known as AIDS. Malaria is a disease caused by a protist. The malarial protist uses a mosquito as its host, and the mosquito is therefore called the vector for the protist, so the mosquito carries the protist around. And when a mosquito bites a human, it can then inject the protist into the human. The main symptom of malaria is a fever and this fever can be fatal and to prevent malaria you need to control the mosquitoes so one way is to remove any standing water to prevent the mosquitoes from breeding because they lay their eggs in water to use insect repellent to deter mosquitoes from biting you and to use mosquito nets again to prevent bites from the mosquitoes which could inject the malarial protist into you. So now on to some plant diseases. The first is tobacco mosaic virus and this is a virus that affects many plant species and the symptoms are a mosaic pattern of discoloration on the leaves and this causes a reduced rate of photosynthesis because there's less chlorophyll to absorb the sunlight for photosynthesis and this in turn causes reduced growth rates and the only real treatment for it is to dig up and burn infected plants so they don't infect others. The other plant disease is rose black spot. This is a fungal disease which is spread through water or wind. And this causes purple or black spots on the leaves. And similarly to the um, tobacco mosaic virus, it also causes a reduction in photosynthesis. Again, because there's less chlorophyll now because they're all blackened to absorb the sunlight for photosynthesis. And this in turn therefore redu reduces the growth rate of the plant as well. And the leaves turn yellow and fall off. So treatment, you can get a fungicidal spray to spray the plants with, or you can remove and destroy infected leaves. To prevent disease, you can 
ensure that you are being hygienic by washing your hands and catching sneezes in tissues and binning them. You can destroy vectors, for example using insecticides or culling animals to stop them from spreading diseases. You can isolate infected individuals, so some diseases are so infectious that infected individuals need to be isolated in special hospital wards. And you can also use vaccinations, which we'll talk about in more detail later. Some basic defences that your body has against disease include hair and mucus in the nose to trap pathogens, skin, which is a physical barrier to pathogens entering your body, but also it produces antimicrobial substances to kill pathogens. There is hydrochloric acid in the stomach to kill pathogens, so anything that you eat with bacteria on it, that acid will be a good defence against that. The trachea and the bronchi produce mucus to trap pathogens. And there are ciliated cells which waft the mucus out of the airways to the throat where it can be swallowed. So these hairs here on the top of this cell are called cilia and they move backwards and forwards to push the mucus out of the airways towards the throat. But if pathogens do enter your body, you have another defence system, which is your immune system, and this is where the white blood cells come into play. So white blood cells do three main things. The first thing is phagocytosis, which means that they engulf the foreign cells or the pathogens and digest them. So when the white blood cell sees a pathogen, it will engulf it and destroy it. You cannot say that they eat it, they don't have mouths or teeth. You can say that they destroy it or digest it. The next thing that they do is produce antibodies. So foreign cells or pathogens have unique protein markers called antigens on, that, on their surface. So this here would be the antigen. And white blood cells produce antibodies specific to the antigen, so it's a locking key, they fit exactly to that particular pathogen. And antibodies bind to the antigen and help clump the pathogens together. And then they signal to the phagocytes to come and engulf them. And the final thing that white blood cells do is produce antitoxins. And these neutralise the toxins that are produced by pathogens. Vaccinations can be used to prevent disease. In a vaccination you inject a dead or inactive or weakened form of the pathogen into the patient. Their white blood cells make antibodies specific to the antigens on the inactive pathogen. The pathogen is then destroyed by white blood cells. If a person is infected with a live pathogen later on, then their white blood cells, called memory cells, will rapidly produce the correct antibody, preventing the person becoming ill. MMR is a specific vaccine that you need to know about that prevents measles, mumps and rubella. Disadvantages of vaccines, well, they don't always work and they can have side effects, so headaches and things like that. But the positives, of course, are that epidemics, so large outbreaks, can be prevented if a large proportion of the population are vaccinated. So here's a common graph used in exams. On the left hand side it shows the concentration of antibodies in the blood and then it's time along the bottom. So if we look at the first part of the graph, at this point here a person is vaccinated. There's a short lag time as your body reacts to the dead or weakened form of the pathogen in your body and your body starts to produce antibodies which will be specific to the antigen on the pathogen. That concentration of antibodies increases over time till it reaches a peak and then it will decrease and you'll have fewer antibodies in your blood and then it will decrease and decrease and decrease over time. 
Then, if you are actually infected with the real pathogen by coming into contact with an infected person, then your body then rapidly produces the correct antibody because of those memory cells that remember the correct antibody to make. So you get a steeper rise in antibody body production after you're actually infected with the real thing. You get less lag time because your antibodies are produced really quickly and you have a longer lasting high concentration of antibodies in the blood. So they stay around in your blood fighting off that pathogen that you have been infected with. So a little bit on herd immunity in this diagram we've got two people here in red that are unvaccinated and the rest of the population is vaccinated. So with herd immunity most of the population is vaccinated and healthy so they're not getting ill from catching a pathogen and vaccinated individuals therefore don't catch and spread disease. So unvaccinated individuals are less likely to catch the disease. So the ones in red, the unvaccinated, are protected because the majority of the population is vaccinated. So we call this herd immunity. So not everyone in the population needs to be vaccinated, but when the majority are, because they can't catch and spread the disease, that protects the unvaccinated individuals as well. Drugs originate from plants. Aspirin is a painkiller which originates from willow. Digitalis is used to treat heart conditions and this originates from foxgloves. Not plants, but we're looking at um, fungi this time. Alexander Fleming dis discovered penicillin, which is an antibiotic, and he discovered that in mould, which was growing on a petri dish. Painkillers treat symptoms of diseases. They don't actually cure a disease, they just treat the symptoms. And antibiotics are drugs that only kill bacteria, so they can't be used on viruses or other pathogens, only bacteria. So we just said antibiotics are used to treat bacteria, but there's a growing problem in that the bacteria themselves can become resistant to antibiotics, and this means that the antibiotics no longer work and no longer kill the bacteria. Bacteria divide rapidly and they double around every 20 minutes and the bacteria produce toxins which make us feel ill so we start to take antibiotics to kill the bacteria. But any bacteria not yet killed by the antibiotics will continue to multiply. And just by chance, as the bacteria are multiplying by a process called binary fission, it could be that a mutation causes one of the bacteria to become resistant to the antibiotics. So I've just shown this one in red here. So just by chance, a mutation has caused this bacteria in red to become resistant to the antibiotics. So you'll continue to take the antibiotics and some of the surviving ones will continue to multiply including the resistant strain but the antibiotics don't kill the resistant strain because they're resistant to it. It's not effective in killing those cells. So those resistant um, bacteria will continue to multiply and eventually you will end up with a resistant strain and with that resistant strain the antibodies the antibiotics are no longer effective and the scientists will therefore have to work fast to try and find another antibiotic which is going to be effective against this resistant strain. So the two main things that we can do to prevent antibiotic resistance coming, becoming a problem is that doctors shouldn't over-prescribe antibiotics. 
So they should only give antibiotics when needed to treat bacterial infections. They shouldn't give them out for viral infections, etc. And also, patients should take the full course of antibiotics. So not stop when they feel better, but take the full course that the doctor prescribes for them. Otherwise, there's a chance that the bacteria could mutate when they divide and cause an antibiotic-resistant strain to arise. For example, there is an antibiotic-resistant bacteria called MRSA, for you to be aware of, and that is resistant to most antibiotics. So doctors are really worried about an outbreak of MRSA because they don't have very many antibiotics that are effective against that bacteria. Before drugs can be used in hospitals and sold in pharmacies, they go through a rigorous drug testing process. And the start of that is preclinical testing, where drugs are tested using computer models, cells and tissues, and animals. And the main things that are being tested for are toxic toxicity, so does it kill cells or cause any harm, efficacy, which means does it work as it's supposed to, and dose, how much should be given and how often. After the preclinical stage, there is the clinical stage, and the first stage of this is a small group of healthy volunteers are given a low dose, and this is normally in the form of a double blind trial, which we'll go into in a sec. They're testing for side effects, efficacy, and dose. They're the main things they're testing for. Hopefully you're not testing for toxicity at this case because that means it can kill or harm. The second stage of clinical testing is that patients with the disease are given the drug. And again, this is a double blind trial. And you're looking again for side effects, efficacy and dose. And the important thing is the drug testing process is peer reviewed. This means the results are checked by independent scientists. And because they're independent and nothing to do with the drug testing process or the company involved, it avoids bias and prevents false claims by a drug company. So when, with a clinical trial, patients are split randomly into two groups and one group is given the drug and the other is given the placebo, for example. These circles here could be given the placebo. And a placebo is an injection or a pill that does not contain the drug, sometimes described as a fake drug. It doesn't actually contain the drug, but the patient will still get the injection or the pill when the drug trial takes place. There's two types of trial. The first one is a blind trial. This is when the patient doesn't know if they've taken the drug or the placebo, but the doctor does. And this prevents the placebo effect. So when the patient expects the drug to work, so starts to feel better, even if the drug is having no effect. So it's a psychological reaction to the injection or pill, even though it doesn't actually contain any, any drugs to help them with their condition. And the most common one is a double blind trial. And in this one, neither the doctor nor the patient knows who has taken the drug and who has taken the placebo. So this prevents the doctor subconsciously influencing the patient. 